Hey, this is Father Dave, and um, I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Reverend Joyce Dill Perkins, from the St David's Uniting Church in Haberfield. Yes. And we're here to. Well, we, what are we here to do? We, we, we thought we'd talk a little about what's going on in the world yeah. and in the country, yeah. uh, with a view to offering maybe a, a, a sort of specifically Christian perspective, and I guess that's because we feel that not enough Christian people are talking perhaps about things going on in the world. Or well, their voices are particularly one-sided. Yeah, when they are saying something, they often yeah. tend to be yeah. saying things that we find, that a lot of people find offensive. Yeah. So anyway, um, we thought we'd offer a few, few perspectives mm -hmm. on things we've been discussing, um, things that come to mind for me, the bushfires, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the assassination of the Iranian general mm -hmm. by the Americans and the um, subsequent events flowing from that, and possibly also something about Julian. I thought. Yeah. Um, did you have other so, things? No, here? I think we're going to run it for about 50, fifteen minutes each. Well, week. let's see how we go. That's the idea. I might get on a roll. We could go for <laughs> hours. <laughs> yeah, you might. Depends how patient Denning is on the camera. Um, should we start, start the, with, with the bushfires? Because I, so. I mean, the bushfires we'll are just. Thankfully, today it's a mm. cooler day. We've had a little and bit I'm of rain. Watching my app, and the bushfires seem to have settled mm. a little, thanks mm. be to God, but it's been horrific. It has. Um, I think we all either have been affected or we know someone who has, haven't we? We were, you know, just getting together with friends uh, last night and hearing about helicopter mm. lifts out of the snowy mountains mm. and other friends standing in the sea um, along with all the other people <laughs> who were there because it was the only safe place. Yes. Um, watching things burning. Just everybody waist deep in the water mm. watching the burning. With horses and budgies yeah. and... Well, um, this, the thing too, it's not just, I mean, the devastation, the deaths of people, the devastation of homes, but I mean, I'm reading a billion animals as well, mm. uh, which is... I don't know how that affects the ecosystem as a whole, but it sounds terrible. I was reading somewhere that it's meant that some animals are brought nearer to extinction than would have, it would have not been had this not happened. Um, but it's also people's livelihoods, isn't it? I mean, it's lives, it's property, but it's also those people who make money at this time of year from holiday makers yeah, i mean we yeah, both know yeah. people who just aren't going on holiday anymore they're not going down there well yeah fran was my daughter youngest was yeah. down there on holiday and she got not caught by the fires but in mm. a fire zone and had to get out mm. we've had other friends who well, we've had friend from the parish a lawyer who's had his whole property destroyed mm. and we've got our campsite out at Pinacrombie, which has been under constant threat mm. uh, dear bob's out there bob mm. holding the fort but he says sometimes you can't see your hand in front of the face because of the smoke. Mm. And it's, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, we're all grieving what's going on and we're all praying for rain. And we've had rain too. And, uh, you know, we pray for rain. We've had some rain. I guess we should be very thankful for that. Mm. Um, you know, apart from that, I'm conscious the only sort of uh, <clears throat> Christian voice speaking on the subject, I think, has been. Um, but a lot of publicity was given to Israel for our yeah. saying. He would even say it was the judgment of God. I read what he did say. Okay. And he said, um, you know, now we've legalised same-sex marriage and we've legalised abortion mm -hmm. um, and now there's all these fires. Do you think that's coincidence? Mm -hmm. So he is suggesting mm -hmm. that it's a judgment call from God, mm -hmm. which um, got a harsh response from both the Prime Minister and the opposition leader and even friends of his like uh, mm. Alan Jones who told him to button up. Mm. I mean, it comes across as insensitive. Rightly so, I find, <laughs> find it offensive. But mm. at the same time, you can understand why from a Christian perspective, you well, you know, is God just irrelevant? No, I mean, we're praying for rain. We're, we see God as involved. Um, I mean, what can we say? I mean, is there any space for talking about judgment? I really don't think so. <laughs> I mean, is a God judging us for our lack of action on climate change? You know, I mean, do we look at it from that angle? 
I mean, you were part of the big climate change march a couple of weeks ago, and then there was another big one this week. Yeah, and they just don't seem to be listening, and that's, I think, people are feeling really frustrated because... um, And this was all led by our young people, of course, which is incredibly encouraging, um, I think. The protests, yes. Yes, yeah, and they don't, you know, governments don't seem to be listening, people are getting frustrated... We need, you know, we need action. We need action rather than calls for judgment. You know, I think, you know, let's actually be doing something like these young people, um, making our voices heard to affect change. It doesn't help anybody. Even if you do believe it's a judgment for God, which I do not, it doesn't help anybody, I don't think, to go down there. Hmm. It's hard because I think, you know, we want to, we don't want, Want to suggest God is relevant to the process, you know, but um, yet at the same time, mm. I don't, yeah, <laughs> my God doesn't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> I hear, I hear, yeah. Um, I don't know how it all works, but I don't think it works like that. There, yeah, that's a deep theological statement. We keep praying for rain. <laughs> yeah, that, that, we're yeah. all united on that one. We keep yeah. praying for more rain. And also, you know, the giving of money, I think, is what we've all been... We're finding is the most effective way as well of supporting the people that whose lives have been devastated. Yeah, um, absolutely right. And, um, I mean, the, 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 the response to the Australian community has been impressive. Yeah. I mean, we've even seen, was it Andrew Forrest or whatever, the billionaire or something, come out with multi-million dollar grants I mean mm. the impression I get is that the Australian people have, have uh, come coming through this really well mm. in terms of uh, it's reflecting well you know how in times of crisis sometimes people sort of loot and pillage and destroy each other mm. and other times they will band together mm. we seem to be banding together and I think we do that quite consistently I mean I've been in Australia what nearly half my life now so maybe I feel I can I can make this comment um, I think that I won't say how long that is no so. thank you we do we do do that and we do do that really well um, you know, and I, for one, being part of the Uniting Church, was very pleased and proud that the moderator came out at the end of November and set up a appeal for people to give money. And then the first day of Advent was a prayer day for those um, affected by the bushfires as well. And that continues on, of course. And it, obviously, it's not just the Uniting Church that's no. doing that. The Young Local no, no, Church has also... come out with the bushfire appeal. Yes. Yeah, um, and that's the very right response, I think, and very much needed. Yeah, but, but you know, from what I hear, just on a local community level, people are really pulling together. Mm. You know, in times of crisis, when people are evacuating, they're not all stampeding, mm. you know, bumping each other out mm. of the way. They're not looting the properties that are left. You know, on yeah. the contrary, people are really uh, standing by each and other. And looking out for each, each other. other. Looking out yeah. for each other. And our friend, she was, you know, in that, in that water mm. with her son, you know, she she was saying how um, people were obviously freaking out, but other people were looking after. The, they were looking after each other in that space, in mm. that really terrifying moment. Um, yeah. Which is yeah, humanity, which is all deeply encouraging, humanity. quite frankly. Yeah. yeah. I so there's so some too. there's some light shining in the darkness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> darkness has not overcome it. No, Thank exactly. God. <laughs> Um, shall we mm. move on to the um, assassination of the Iranian general, yes. Qasem Soleimani? Yeah. I, I wanted to see if I could see how this goes. Dan, see if you can pick this up. I'm going to try and play a 10 second clip. I just found this astonishing. It's called uh, House GOP Leaders Speak After Ar- Iran Fires Missiles at Red Forces in Iran. Um, I don't know exactly who she is. You can see that, okay? Beautiful. Um, let's just ten second clip I wanted to play. Obviously, from the break, um, we're following the news very closely. Uh, we understand the president is uh, going to speak to the nation at eleven o'clock this morning about uh, the circumstances with respect to Iran. Um, we are absolutely unified uh, as a conference, uh, unified behind the president, uh, unified with respect to the uh, importance, the significance, uh, and the righteousness of the act the president took to. Uh, that was that was what I wanted. The righteousness. Did oh, you hear that? Did you okay. hear? We are unified in in, in supporting the righteousness. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
of the action that the president took. <clears throat> Not just the rightness, mm. but the righteousness. Mm. I mean, it's just interesting because you're talking the criticism of Iran, you know, it's a religious government. <clears throat> Pardon me. That's something very overtly religious going on in that. Yeah. <clears throat> in that conference, as, in that uh, group as well. Mm. So the perspective there is they're united in seeing the president as having done something righteous. I can't work out why he did it. I mean, sorry, I shouldn't laugh because it's terrible. Do you it's want to terrible. give a very short pricey of what's happened? Just for... Yeah, okay. So the US president uh, had a targeted assassination on Iranian General Qasem Soleimani and it was he was on a civilian aircraft uh, coming into Baghdad and a drone killed him and killed the deputy of the Iraqi militia and some other people as well, I think. I, I don't know how many people were killed, but um, certainly the main target was uh, Qasem Soleimani and, and perhaps the rest are just collateral damage. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the, the uh, leader, the deputy leader of the militia is a very significant figure uh, as well. I mean, all those people are significant to their families and friends, but mm -hmm. uh, Soleimani, obviously most especially and the, the question for me is what was he thinking mm -hmm. uh, i mean it was uh I, it, you've got the i mean the explicit reason mr trump gave was he said oh this guy was planning something really bad that was going to kill american troops i mean that's just you can't um mm -hmm. take that seriously i mean it's remarkable that no one from the media has said Okay, Mr. President, now that it hasn't happened, can you tell us what it was, mm. the really bad thing mm. that he was planning? No, I mean, it's just, you know, th this idea of starting a preemptive war, which George W. Bush did, of course, you know, with Saddam Hussein's going to do something really bad, mm. you know, so we've got to strike him first. Mm. Uh, it's a terrible uh, principle that you should be striking at other people. Um, I mean, I think I mean. <laughs> When we were with friends last night, I mentioned um, the Monty Python Big Red Book, mm. that, that um, they had the Welsh Art of Lap Gosh. Uh, the Welsh Art of Lap Gosh, it, it's a parody, but it was based on two principles. So the principle that the uh, best form of defence is attack, and that the best form of attack is surprise. And so you defend yourself by going around surprising people by attacking them not only before they attack you, but before they even think of attacking you, before you basically go around assaulting complete strangers. Mm. Uh, it seems to be we're getting close to those mm. sorts of principles here. There's but definitely can... a view of country going on there, isn't it? There's a view of clan, if you like, of tribe and, and us being righteous <laughs> yeah. and and others being well, in, yes, unrighteous. In terms of the country, and I mean, you, you think, okay, the explicit reasons he gives are just fatuous. Pure are. But um, the, the reasons we assume motivate the American presidency with regard to Iran is that they want to make Iran weaker mm -hmm. and that they want to change the government. I mean, weaker in the area, particularly in relation to Saudi Arabia, Israel, their allies, mm -hmm. and uh, they want to change the government. They want away from the religious government to one that will work cooperatively uh, with them, regime change. Now, the action of assassinating Soleimani achieves neither of those things. Mm. Um, on the contrary, I mean, there were protests going on in Iran against the government, but the death of Soleimani has united the people around mm. the government, mm. so it's made the government stronger. Mm. And in terms of their standing in the region, you've now got Iraq asking the Americans to leave. So it's tightening the relationship between Iraq and Iran. The Americans, mind you, haven't said they will leave, but the Iraqi parliament now is officially in response to this asked them to leave. Mm. So it's it's achieved neither, it's neither weakened in Iran nor moved towards regime change. It's strengthened the Iranian government, strengthened their, their position in the region. What on earth was he thinking? So then then we come back to other, you know, either he's completely mad, which I think a lot of the public go to. Yes, right? yes, yes. Or there's something that we don't know. Well, right? he's being advised, isn't he? So mm. he's not just coming up with this idea in his own. Mm. And it may, maybe someone's come into him and said, look, you know, you remember how good it was when you killed off our Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS, 
how, how popular you became through that, but you got another bad guy for you, mm. you know, oh great, mm. you know, it, quite possibly from his point of view, he's been sold it mm. like that, but if that's the case then, and, and yes, he's dealing with his own impeachment trial, yep. and uh, maybe he wants attention drawn away from that, so it's purely something he's doing for a domestic audience. Mm. But if that's the case, the person who's coming and advising this, they must know better. Um, what's driving them, you know? Well, they've got away with so much in the past. I mean, there's been multi multiple things happening that are just against foreign countries that are just bad. <laughs> and there's <clears> been no consequence Well, to America. Yeah, the, I, I hear you, I hear you, and the thing just rolls on yeah. through the... so do they just think now that they can get away with... Look, stuff? if you go, I'm thinking of that famous uh, interview given by General Wesley Clark back in 2001, just after the 9-11 incident, where he was saying, you know, they planned to take out seven countries, which included, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, mm. the, the last of which was um, mm. Iran, you know, and maybe that's still... The over overarching agenda, and they think they can complete that. Maybe, yeah. maybe. But I mean, as I say, it's a backward step in that regard. In terms of their own goals of global hegemony, if that if those are the goals, um, it, it's it's a backward step. That's why I don't. The only person who benefits from this is is the armaments companies. Mm. I mean, and apparently there was a spike, as you expect in share price mm. for both okay. Lockheed Martin and Raytheon Corp and other associated yeah. armaments industries after the US strike mm. on Iran, uh, on the Iranian general in Iraq, mind you. This isn't an oil thing again, is it? I, look, America doesn't need um, Iranian oil. Mm. So, you, or, you know, they've got, they're just about sort of sufficient. They want to control the region, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I don't know. It's 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 um, as I say. Maybe it was done just for a domestic audience. Maybe he thought he'd make himself more popular. But if that's the case, he completely underestimated the significance of the person he was assassinating. Um, I mean, as you know, I was down at the local Shia mosque mm. uh, during the week at a service of remembrance for Qasem Soleimani, and the amount of grieving going on there. Um, you know, hundreds of people mm. had come, and this was the second mm. one in, in my mm. parish area mm. uh, of a service of its kind. I mean, you're not so <coughs> as a saint either. I, I, I never knew the man. This was, I was interviewed on Iranian TV the yeah. other night, and they said, you know, what did you think of it? I never met the man. Mm. I don't know whether he's a lovely man or he's a terrible man, but I know what he's remembered for. What he's remembered for is the guy who defeated ISIS mm. in both Syria and Iraq. Mm. Uh, and that's what, he, and he cooperated, worked with the Americans, I believe, mm -hmm. in, in that process. Mm -hmm. But he is remembered as the guy who turned back ISIS in Syria and, and Iraq. Mm -hmm. Now, I think credit needs to be given to the Russians as well in, in, uh, in, in Syria mm -hmm. for turning back ISIS. Mm -hmm. But Soleimani obviously played a significant role. Okay, he also played a significant role defending, uh, sorry, in Lebanon, working with Hezbollah. Uh, turning back the Israeli attacks there, and he obviously did support the Iraqi militias, and maybe that's where the conflict with American soldiers has happened. I don't know the details. It's interesting that we get these figures about all the American people that were killed by this man, technically, I haven't read any details on, mm. on that. Mm. But I know in terms of the Shia Muslim community worldwide, what he's, what he's associated with is the defeat of ISIS. Mm. Do you think that this is going to be one of those things that we were only going to find out later down the track what this was all about? If, if ever. Yeah. We're still trying to work out what happened to 9-11, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Mm. yeah. All I, I mean, as I say, the best sense I can make of it is that um, the president was acting for a domestic audience and he was fooled into it perhaps by someone who really wants war. Right. That's because Mike of the Pompeo. impeachment stuff, do you mean? Well, I think he probably did it for the sake of mm. diverting people from the impeachment agenda. Yeah. But perhaps the brains behind mm. uh, motivating him to mm. make it happen, uh, there's a more sinister objective, a real desire for all-out war, uh, whether that's coming from within his administration, someone like Mike Pompeo seems to be uh, a 
a crazy bastard, mm. or whether it's coming from influence from outside, from his uh, allies either in, in Israel or Saudi Arabia or both. Mm. Mm. Um, it's hard to know. Yeah. Either way, what I'm personally totally convinced of is that any war with Iran will not only be the end of the American Empire, but it could potentially result in such worldwide devastation and mm. death mm. Uh, on a scale we've... Mm. I mean, Iran is no Iraq. Mm. You know what Chomsky says? When America has to goes to attack another country, it needs um, uh, three things. One, they've got to have something we want. Uh, two, they've got to be unable to defend themselves. And three, we've got to come up with an excuse. Mm. Okay, it was full of excuses. Okay, mm. but the problem is Iran really can defend itself. Mm. It really can. Mm. It's a powerful country with a powerful military. If this is not uh, Iraq. It's not Afghanistan. It's not Somalia. Not even Syria. It's Iran, mm. and they can fight. And, and I think and what dismays a lot of um, people is the fact that our government tends to back up America. You well, know? yeah, America and says jump and we say how mm, high. I mean, mm. it's it's just tragic. It makes you wish we could be the West Island for New Zealand, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. she's pretty amazing. She, she's a great Prime Minister. Yeah. Right? Yes. <laughs> Why can't we have her? Yeah. <laughs> yes. But look, you know, um, Malcolm Fraser was, before his death, was trying to just to break the mm. ties with America. I think it would be such a good thing to do. The last Australian Prime Minister, you remember, who tried to stand up to the Americans was Gough Whitlam. Mm, okay. Get before your time. Before yeah. time. Yeah. Um, no, I was only young, but he tried to get the American bases out of mm. Australia. Yeah. And there was a sudden regime change in yeah. Australia, which yeah. many of us think was not coincidental. Yeah. And I think what we need to remember is that, that, you know, in America itself, there are many good people oh, <laughs> fighting for change. Um, Absolutely right. Yeah. Absolutely right. There's a powerful pe mm. uh, peace protest movement yeah. in America. I've read people trying to send apologies to Iran. Sorry, we're under a totalitarian mm. regime here. Mm. Um, and that standing alongside is so important, isn't it? Mm. I mean, you've seen that time and time again when things have happened and you've stood with the, we've both stood with the um, Muslim community um, yeah. and how powerful that is. Yeah, and I, I think this is it. This is a time of grieving for the Shia community in particular mm. who feel they've lost mm. one of their sons, mm. regardless of what mm. uh, yeah. the narrative coming from the American President's office is, the um, perspective of so many Shia Muslims is, mm. this was a guy who defended our people. Mm. And I think what's difficult, one of the things that's difficult for us here in Australia is we're grieving, we're already grieving. Loss of life, lost. and yeah, yeah. so there's this yeah. kind of this sense of there's too much grief going on here. There's grief at home, and there's grief overseas, and you know we're kind of entering a new year, and we kind of wonder where where is the hope in that? Where is? Yeah. Um, and I think what yeah. you're talking about yeah. about people standing alongside people in solidarity with people in that grief is um, what we do, isn't it? <laughs> Because we can't change what well, we can, I suppose, long term by acting and lobbying, but um, in the short term, both of those things go hand in hand, don't they, really? The, the broader vision and the broader action, and then the very one on one, local, intimate um, action. Yeah, yeah, look, and hopefully one feeds off the other. Mm. Because, um, I think we need to hear the grief of the Shia Muslim community mm. <laughs> to understand. Um, the full picture mm. of what's happening there. Mm. But I think too, we just need to have a realistic um, understanding of how terrible a war with Iran mm. would be mm. for all of us mm. if we got involved. Mm. And uh, I, I don't think that's likely. I think the Iranian response thus far to the assassination was symbolic mm. and measured and no Americans were killed and I assume that was deliberate. Mm. And uh, that could possibly be the end of it, but we've still got the response to come from the Iraqi militia mm. whose deputy was killed mm. along with Soleimani. Mm. And they have said that their response will be no less than the Iranian response. Mm. 
again. We wait and see what happens. We wait and see what happens. Mm. They've, yeah, they have to act now in, out of their pride and dignity mm. and retaliate. It's the way it works, mm. unfortunately. Mm. So, yeah, what do we do? We pray. Mm. And we act. Yeah, yeah. I'm at a local level. I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to a protest this afternoon. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the American Embassy, of course, um, no war with Iran. Mm. Um, I don't think this country would want to go to war with no. Iran. Um, I, I don't understand why any country... Um, I've, some of my Iranian friends... Um, are, one more story I mentioned was... Um, going to school, saying going to school in Iran, we were brought up, told about the heroes when the 12, 13 year old boys who uh, go out and throw themselves under tanks during the Iran-Iraq war. And you remember the Iran-Iraq war, so many Iranian lives lost, twice the number of Iranians of Iraqis, largely because the Iranians refused to use chemical weapons, which were to their credit, but it resulted in enormous loss of life. But you know, what they did use was these battalions of young boys hurling themselves under tanks. And they, they were considered heroes by kids growing up in school in Iran. Mm. I read an Iranian author once who said, what country in its right mind would attack a country that does that to their children? Mm. Okay. Um, mm. I'm not sure what to, where to go with that, but I think that's that, that is telling. I really think what country in its right mind would attack Iran? So that's my prayer every morning. Mm. No war with Iran. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> I'm wondering about time, actually. So whether we've got time for another topic or whether we. Well, let's. Yeah, you're right. We've we've, we've gone on a bit, but um, <laughs> I, I don't want to miss just saying a word of support for Julian. I'm just worried yes. about him, yep. about his health. Yeah. He's in Belmarsh Prison. He's being treated, uh, you know, in a maximum security facility, as if he's a serial killer. Um, his crime is exposing the uh, crimes of uh, uh, the Bush administration in particular, mm. but that's been the mm. pattern with uh, WikiLeaks. It's exposing the crimes of people in high places, mm. and the people in high places mm. don't appreciate it. And it's been interesting to see how the kind of public opinion for Julian has changed. So I, for one, was one of those people who went, well, he's a rapist. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'll put my hand up to that. I, I did. And then the more I've read and talked to his dad and, um, yeah. you know, you realise that it's part of um, a plan to um, bring him into disrepute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And those charges have now been dropped, right? Yeah. yeah. So I was definitely one of those people who was thinking, oh, gosh. And so, you know, particularly as a woman, and there's like, so already you've got half the population anti that's right. I you mean, they, they, interestingly, they tried to discredit, I think, both his male deputies in exactly the same way. Yeah. Not very creative. Mm. But what's, you know, Julian all the time has been, was saying while he was in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, no, they don't want to take me to Sweden. If I go out here, mm. uh, they want to get mm. me straight to the US. Mm. The Sweden thing's just a ruse. And I think now that's obvious. Mm. Uh, you know, it's... but. Yeah, so the, the the all the counter narratives are sort of dissolved now. Mm. It's, yeah, mm. exactly as he said. Mm. As soon as he got out, the US put in their extradition order, mm. and mm. that's the issue. They want to take him to the US. Mm. They've already got a court arraigned there. They're ready to lock him away uh, for half a dozen lifetimes. Yeah, um, and we know his dad's going out and visiting him quite regularly. Well, his dad's moving out there to London for the trial next mm. month, yeah. and. Um, to be with him for that, mm-hmm. but at the moment he, he's very restricted even in who he can be visited by. Um, he said the doctors, right? There was an open letter, I mm-hmm. think, wasn't there, by mm-hmm. something like sixty-five doctors who said his conditions are not good and they're going to kill him. That his conditions are going to, you know. Yeah, I'm, you know, is that what they want? Um, it's hard to know. I mean. I know with my friend Mordechai Benunu, who was in prison mm. in Israel for 18 years, I think that he did 11 and a half in solitary, and the idea there was, I think, to drive him mad and just discredit him mm. Mm. that way. I mean, I would think the danger from the point of view of those who want to damage Julian 
is that if they kill him in prison, they'll make a martyr of him. I mean, that surely is not their goal. I mean, I hate even thinking in these terms, but mm. I think they probably want to make an example of him and they mm. want this court case. So mm. surely they don't want to kill him. Mm. I hope they don't want to kill him. Mm. I don't know. but um, And I don't know why he's being treated like a sort of A-grade criminal where he is. I mean, from the point of view, from my point of view, for many of us, the man's a hero. Mm. I mean, it's the way um, a number of key whistleblowers have been treated. Um, it's not... Yeah. That's exactly right. Mm. And I think what we've got to keep remembering, to not report a crime is a crime. Mm. You know, yeah. so if we see someone being attacked out on the street there and we just close the shutters mm. and don't say anything, that is a crime. Mm. We're responsible. If we know what's going on, mm. we're responsible to report it. And that's exactly what Julian did. He reported mm. crimes. Mm. Crimes are terrible crimes. Terrible oh, crimes yes. against the people of Iraq. Yeah. War crimes. He exposed them and he's now being punished for that. Yeah. And, and you know, we look at the key whistleblowers that we know of and you look at the consequences of them <laughs> telling the truth, um, that's going to put people off, you know what I mean? Well, that's, doing, that's the idea. Doing yeah. that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Tra- the, the, the importance of truth-telling and we have governments who um, punish people who tell the truth. The world's gone mad. <laughs> Well, that's always been a pattern. Yeah. What did Jesus say? They stone the prophets and persecute the ones God sent, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those who shine the light in the darkness mm. often pay the price yeah. for that. Yeah. And so, I think, you know, that that is our hope, I suppose, isn't it? That's the hope that I come back to. <coughs> Pardon me. Because it is that the, the, the light shines. The light shines and the darkness hasn't overcome it. And no. that's what I hold on to when we're thinking and experiencing really difficult um, loss and grief and pain. <coughs> Pardon me. Yeah. Pardon me Rushing. for finishing on a <laughs> cold note. <laughs> we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. Mm.